Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 618. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing. as we unite together in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Heavenly Father, what we desire to do is worship you this morning. It's not, oh God, that we initiate this uh, based upon uh, our own fruition, but uh, it is a response to what you started. 
It's a response, O oh God, to what you have initiated in our world around us and even in our hearts. And because you know us, O oh God, we know that you are aware that we gather this as we gather this morning, that you are that you see that we come from different places, from different areas of anxiety, from different areas of, of, of pain and hurt and depression, and even different areas of joy and excitement. And what we ask, O oh God, is that you would help us break through those areas that are so evident in our hearts and so pressing upon our hearts that we may be able to see the light of your presence this morning. And we pray, O oh God, that, that as we focus less on ourselves and more on you, that you would receive our worship and that it would live and be sealed and to be woven into the fabric of our hearts as we live out this upcoming week. Set ablaze, O oh God, in our hearts, your spirit, who is welcome in this place to come and go in and out of each aisle and in between each pew and touching our hearts, O oh God, in the way that you only know how. And we'll be careful, O oh God, that, that we give you all honor and glory and praise as we remember the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. <coughs> Receive these, O oh God, your tithes and our offerings. Allow them, O oh God, to be multiplied so that we may be able in this church further your kingdom and hasten your return. Amen.
please remain standing as we read our scripture passage from the book of Philippians chapter 4. Finally, beloved, what is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. The peace of Christ be with you. you. I welcome you once again to our worship services. Members and visitors alike, we're so very glad that you're with us today. There's a red pew pad. If you wouldn't mind registering your attendance, passing it down, passing it back again, you can learn the names of those who are worshiping with you today. And uh, as you welcome each other, I welcome the uh, children or invite the children to come forward for the children's sermon. How you doing? Do y'all ever, uh, I got something I really like and I write with all the time. It's a pencil. It is a pencil, that's right. You like pencils? No. You don't like pencils? What do you like, pens? Markers? Markers. You like marker crayons? But who likes, does anybody like pencils? Nobody? Got a couple of people? What's your favorite part about the pencil? Um, you can stay inside the lines very easily. You can, that's right. It helps you stay wait, inside the lines. Wait. In the, in right, in you like right the, there, you like that? Yeah. right there is made of rock. Uh, made of rock, okay, yeah, close to that, yeah. It so, is rock. Okay, that's fine, that's all right. Well, you know what my favorite part of the pencil is? What? This part. Eraser. The eraser. You can erase it. Right, which means if I make a mistake, guess what I can do? Erase it. I can. It's like I, it's like, it's like I, 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 You are 100% right. <laughs> Well, i tell you what, uh, in just a few minutes, you can help me on the sermon, too. That's right. I know what you, sometimes you, the eraser, the reason why I like the eraser, because it gets rid of, it gets rid of stuff that you want to erase. He does, and God has a good eraser. It's called forgiveness, and you were right to point that out. And so if we write sometimes outside the lines, or even if we do something outside the lines, you know, God has a giant eraser that we call grace, and he can just kind of get rid of it. And the reason he's able to do that is because of Jesus Christ. So I know that y'all don't like pencils that much. We'd rather have markers or pens or crayons. But if you ever use a pencil, I want you to think about the eraser, okay? And I want you to know that God loves you. Can you do that? Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's pray, okay? Could you bow your heads and shut your eyes with, with me? Well, God, we give thanks uh, that you have just a wonderful eraser that we call forgiveness. And we experience that. And uh, not, not only does it rid us of things that um, have a way of separating us from you and from other people and even from who, who we are in you, uh, we, we need that. And for that, we give thanks. We pray, O oh God, for those who sit with me, continually watch over their life. Bless them, O oh Lord. Keep them safe. Help them to know and to live out of Uh, the love that you have for them, and and allow that to be a dominant force inside of their life on how they see themselves and how they see the world. Bless them, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Please uh, pray with me. God, what we do at this time is we ask the Lord your blessings upon the reading of the text in such a way that uh, it becomes the gospel. And it ends up uh, moving inside of us and inside of this place. Prepare our hearts to receive the text. At the same time, prepare our hearts uh, for 
the receiving of communion this morning. And we ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. How many of you are familiar with uh, Nicholas Herman? Is that not a name that gets thrown around at your uh, dinner table uh, when you eat together? But maybe you might know him by another way, uh, the name Brother Lawrence. Uh, Brother Lawrence lived uh, 1611, 1691, lived in France. Um, his early life was very difficult. He, he, his parents were peasants, and so he, he grew up very poor. Uh, and basically at a fairly young age, he just for survivability uh, had to join the army. He knew that if he joined the army that uh, they would at least provide food, they would provide shelter. And so it became just an existence for him uh, early on in his life. Not long into his time of service, he has uh, what he calls this spiritual experience from of all things by just looking at a barren tree in the middle of winter. Uh, the tree was just uh, a trunk and just some limbs. It did not have leaves, it did not have any fruit on it. And so he looked at this tree and he began to realize that in a few months, what is barren now would eventually be, be filled with abundance. And he made the conclusion that if this happens to this tree, then surely it could happen to his own life. And so if God would take care of this tree, in abundance, then God would surely pour in in abundance His grace and mercy inside of His own life now and for the future. And so it began then a journey of His life where, where He began to understand that God loved Him and that God cared for Him and, and that just began something simmering inside of His heart and His soul few years after this, he gets injured as a foot soldier, and so he's forced into retirement. And so he ends up joining a monastery in Paris. He's uneducated, so he has to join as a lay person. In that day, there wasn't public education. Basically, education was still fairly private. There were universities, but they were for, they were very expensive. They were often for people who were pursuing law degrees or some, some level of profession in the law, some level of profession in teaching, uh, and then at the same time, maybe set aside for those who were entering into uh, the ministry as clergy. So he is assigned to the kitchen and he stayed there for the rest of his life. His job was, was to cook for all those that were in the monastery. His job was to, to clean up after all the individuals that either lived there or would be visiting there. And, and a few years into this role, he discovered something. He began to watch all the clergy and all the different teachers in the monastery and how they would come up with all these elaborate and, and, and all these fantastic, wonderful ways, grandiose ways to convince them that God loved them. And he wrote in his journal, he, 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 he wrote after observing all that, he says, people invent all these ways to remind them of God's love. He says, it seems a world of trouble to me. It should be, and in fact is, very simple. Just do everything that you do with the understanding that God loves you and you love God that we don't need all these elaborate ways, that anything, even the common business, no matter how mundane or how rout routine, was a medium by which to experience God's love. So it goes on to write about how, <coughs> he goes on to, to, to write about how in, in anything that he would do, whether it be uh, frying a cake in the pan or in a worship service similar to this or whether it be gathering straw at the end of the day all of that was a means by which to experience God and to know that God loves him and so every detail of his life whether at work or whether at play was of surpassing value because God was in the middle of that he said, I begin to live with this disposition of the heart that it, it, if there were not anything else in the world, there would at least be God and me, and that was enough. Now, many of you probably aren't familiar with Brother Lawrence, but maybe you know the name Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen was a uh, famous theologian 
mystic writer of the previous century died in the late night, 1900s. He, uh, he had a post at Yale Divinity School, a post at uh, Harvard Divinity School, and was sought after by both the Catholic side of the church and the Protestant side of the church. About midway through what would be his career, probably about my age, he gave all that up and ended up moving to Canada and he lived in something similar of a modern day monastery, taking care of a young man who was mentally challenged and a quadriplegic named Adam. And so for the rest of his life, his job as he saw it was just to care for this guy. And so a, a number of folks, since he was so famous and, and so well known and such a salt after a lecturer and writer, people would, would travel up to this monastery and they would want to sit with him and at, you know, would ask him at least what's the angle? Why is he doing this? Is, this, is he setting up for his next book where he's going to write about all that he's learned from caring for Adam? And, and Time Magazine went to see him one time and, and they begin to sort of push and prod and to quiz him and why he's doing that. And finally, he interrupted the, the, uh, the person and said, uh, you think I'm doing this uh, where I'm trying to teach Adam and trying to teach all the people at the monastery and trying to teach all the people who, who've now traveled to come and live in this place because I'm here. You think I'm doing this because I'm going to teach them something. He said, you got it backwards. I'm the one that's learning. And Adam is my teacher. Because whether or not it's something that's grandiose or whether it's something so mundane as feeding and caring, so, routine, so, so much of the routine, he said, God's in the middle of this. He says, I, I'm the one that's learning. Brother Lawrence lived his entire life in this monastery with a sense of peace, a sense of humility, and a sense of joy regardless of circumstances. That's been my prayer for us, for me, for you, as we now we move into this new year, 2015. That our life would be filled with those three things that regardless of our circumstances, that we would experience peace, whether it be the apex, the high points, or whether it be those bottom valley, dungeon feeling type experiences that are rock bottom, regardless of the circumstances, we would experience peace, we would experience and live out of humility, and we would know joy regardless of what comes our way. And Brother Lawrence, is a fantastic template for this type of life. I, I, I wanna just pull out three themes that were dominant in his life that led to these types of experiences. I, I, I don't know what your plans are, what your priorities or goals are for 2015, but, but I, I, I do know this, if these are in some form or fashion or a part of it, you, your life will have some elements of peace. It, your, your life, you will approach things with humility and regardless of circumstances, you will have some levels of joy. Listen to me, joy is not defined by your circumstances. Joys transcend that. And you can experience joy regardless if it's the top or the bottom. And so I want you to consider these things. See these as a whole, not as one more important than the other. Imagine a equilateral triangle with each of these being one of the points. See, see them all together. And that's the first is this. Brother Lawrence, and you can, you can do the same thing with Henry Nouwen if you follow Henry Nouwen, or at least read his writings. Both of them cultivated a hunger for a divine presence in their life. Which means that they, things like prayer, things like worship, things like study, that they, they cultivated that. Which meant they, they, they prayed. So, so often I think we, 
we wonder about how to pray, what's the means, what the, what's the method, are we doing it right? We, we've published things around here. There are a thousand books on, to teach you how to pray. They are important, but they are secondary. What's primary is that you just pray. And if you don't know what that's like, just start talking to God like you talked to each other in the fellowship moments, that's enough. You know how you learn to pray? You just pray. Sometimes that's outward and it's speaking. Sometimes it's, it's reflection. It's thinking on the inside. Can you cultivate asking God to be with you in prayer? Worship. Study. You know why we have about a gazillion studies around here and they're all at different times and we archive them and we save them and we edit them and we cut and paste? Do you know why? To make it easy. We, we live in a biblical, illiterate society. Do not raise your hand. By the way, how much time do you spend reading the Bible, studying? I bet we read... Uh, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The Hunger Games, People Magazine. Now we have no problem reading those daily and we start our day with that. But yet, if you ask us to read the Bible, much less study it, whoa, wait a minute. But now we'll argue about what the Bible says. That's ironic, isn't it? The average person spends less than five minutes daily, if you want to know. How do we expect to cultivate a divine presence if we're not willing to talk, to reflect, to worship, or to even study? I mean, what do we believe about the Bible? Ask, you'll receive, seek, you'll find, knock, there will be door, door will be open. What does Jesus say? Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. To give a paraphrase, who hunger and thirst after a divine presence in their life. See, the problem is we just don't want too much of that in our life. What we want is Mary Poppins. You know that story? What's that song? A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Do you remember the scene of that? They got to clean their room. Who likes cleaning the room? Wouldn't it be better just to snap our fingers and it all rolls into place? That's what we want, Mary Poppins. We want just enough so that our life is somewhat easy. Maybe the wheels get greased and, and we have some levels, you know, really pain-free, life's okay. And so that's our template for spirituality. Smooth, easy. Maybe the better template would be more like, uh, you ever go deep sea fishing? I like deep sea fishing. Sometimes you get on the boat and it's fairly smooth. Doesn't require a lot of activity. The, you know, you don't have to burn a lot of gas getting out there. It's okay. It's good. Sometimes it's not. And it's white knuckling the whole way out there. And that's a lot like life. Sometimes it's smooth. Sometimes it's torrent. What the divine presence is keeps you above regardless of circumstances. That's something Mary Poppins doesn't do. You can tell that my house has been inundated with Disney. So over the next couple of ser sermons, you might get some Disney, Disney analogies. But sooner or later, we do have to cultivate a divine presence. Not, not only did uh, Brother Lawrence excel in that, Bro Brother Lawrence, and this is really important, realized early on God really did want to be with him. Do you really believe God loves you? I don't, I know what you hear from me. I know what you hear from John. I know what you hear from books that you might read, from, from lessons that, you know, studies. Do you really believe it? To where it's down into the fabric of your being. Not something to where, where you go and earn it and you achieve it and you sign up and you do all these things and you create this resume and then you, you say to God, here's who I am. This is all that I've done. I've done so good. I, I look at who I am. Surely you've got to love me now. Do you, I mean, is that it? Is that our approach to God? What's the default mechanism for God? 
It's he loves you. That's it. Not after you do everything, before. Brother Lawrence, he sees this tree of all things, a tree in the winter. And he realizes that if God can care for this tree, because that's his disposition, then can you imagine how he'll care for me? I mean, do you really believe that? You know, I don't know if you catch this, but we, we, we close the children's sermon the same way. It, it's really a prayer. I, I pray this for my, I've prayed, I don't pray many things for my children, but about four or five things that show up every single day. And one of them is, is that they'll know from the earliest of their age, God loves them. And that becomes how they see themselves. And if they see themselves that way, then they'll see other people that way. If they get that right, pretty much everything else is gonna be okay. Do you hear the children's sermon? I mean, do you really, if the core of your being, do you understand his default mechanism is first love for you? And it's not dependent on how well you get it right or how, how many times you've gotten it wrong. His goodness is always better than our badness. Brother Lawrence lived with that first. That was it. So, so when he approached his work, when he approached his play, he, he started with that. So everything was a means for him to experience the love of God because God was already there. At work, at play, with, friend, with family, God was there. One of the things I love about this text that John read for you, uh, Paul is closing a letter and he says, all these things, if it's good, honorable, just, true, think on these things. And, and then there's this connection word, and cultivate, this is a paraphrase, cultivate a divine presence with God and live in peace. I mean, what else would you want for 2015? For you, for your family? It starts with making room for God, which leads us to the third point. Sooner or later, we're gonna have to mind our boundaries. To use uh, church language on the Sabbath. Let, let, let me tell you what the Sabbath is not. And, and, it, and I, I love this aspect of Sunday morning. The, the Sabbath is not about you waking up and coming to church and then going to lunch and then coming home and taking a nap. Now that's my routine. And, I, and I'm a, prop, a proponent of that, I'll tell you. It is fantastic at 12.01 and then about 1.30 because we finished here, we go to lunch, we finish lunch about 1.30, 2 o'clock and that's bedtime for me. That's not necessarily the Sabbath, at least not the way Jesus describes it. The Sabbath is a gift for you so that your life would be in balance, that you would own boundaries, that you would, that you would own priorities and then you would protect them. You're not one dimensional, which means your whole life isn't about work or it isn't about play or it isn't about worship. There are times where you work there are times where you play and there's time that you protect so that you can reflect, you can worship and you can be with God. And we struggle with that. And so maybe the first step that we take in this next year, because it, this is a theological, let me give you a good theological word why we need to mind our boundaries. It is because we stink at it. We're horrible. For instance, how many of you are dead tired at this very moment? You just been on a two week break? Lighter schedule? I mean, I know it's end of the year stuff, but you know, I've seen some of y'all. Y'all haven't been working. 
So we should be energized, and yet we're, we're more tired now than we were two weeks ago. Explain to me why I feel that way. Hey, I got an excuse. All the busy season for the church, it's now. We stink at it. I know that's not real theological, but you get the point. And you can't cultivate a divine presence. And we can't, um, it's hard for us to get in the mindset to understand that God really does love us if you're dead tired and you got no energy. Because things that you value the most about yourself and things that you value the most about your faith and about your family, guess what? They all take energy. And if you're walking around with about a quarter to about an eighth of a tank, you can't cultivate those things. I don't know what your goals are for 2015. But I'll tell you what's consistent with the history of people who have walked with God. They live with a sense of peace. They live with a sense of humility, with a sense of love for themselves and love for other people. They live with a sense of joy that transcends circumstances. And the themes that show up in their life are these three. They cultivated a divine presence in their life everywhere they went regardless of what they were doing it all was God friendly they understood and they believed and it was part of their being that God really does care for them as if they're the only one and they protected that and they might, they, 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 uh, they put a fence around that which meant in order to say yes to that, they learned to say no to something else. That's a lot like communion. What do you do? You come here, where are you? You're at a table that's set. Whose presence? God's presence. You come and receive physical, tangible things in hopes that you, by holding, smelling, eating, taking them in, you, you would actually know that God loves you. Why? Because we say there's something about the bread and there's something about the cup that stand for God's love in Christ for you and for me. And then we leave here. We leave here going that we take that with us which means we protect it, we feed it, and we care for it. I don't know what your priorities are in 2015. I, I, I can promise you if there are these, it's gonna look different, regardless of what comes your way. So may it be for you. If you would turn with me to page 12 in our hymn books. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live at peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join there in ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
for your love and your mercy. We give thanks. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in all things that our life will glorify you. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.
blessing of grace and mercy that you give to us. For that, we are grateful. For that, we ask, O oh Lord, that your name be glorified forever. Amen.
grace and mercy. We are humbled and give thanks. We ask, O Lord, for your name to be glorified now and forever. Amen. invite you to take your hymn books, turn with me to hymn number 623. Here, O my Lord, I see thee. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fifth stanzas together. Stand as you're able, 623, first, second, and fifth. you to receive this benediction. Amen.